Turn now to Iran. This headline, U.S. accuses Iran in plot. The United States has accused Iranian officials of plotting to kill Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States. Officials say Iranian agents tried to recruit a member of a Mexican drug cartel to kill the Saudi envoy in Washington. Attorney General Eric Holder said members of the Iranian government and Iran's Quds forces were involved in the plot. U.S. officials said Iran would be held accountable and announced new sanctions. Joining me now from Washington, D.C., former FBI official John Miller and Roya Hakakian, author of Assassins of the Turquoise Palace, a book on the murder of four Iranians in a Berlin restaurant in 1992. I'm pleased to have both of them. John Miller, tell me about this story, which you said to me as we began, if somebody had presented this as a movie script, people in Hollywood that you know would have rejected it as too unlikely. Well, the whole idea that the um, elements of Iranian intelligence services are going to approach um, the fairly undisciplined and wild Los Zetas Mexican drug crew uh, working for the cartels to do an assassination of the Saudi ambassador to the United States in a Washington restaurant with collateral damage and other casualties. It just screams unlikely, which, if you actually understand um, the very odd way that the Iranian intelligence services and military services work, starts to make almost perfect sense. Uh, and so, therefore, you believe the story, and, and Eric Holder certainly does, and certainly the administration does, and certainly the Secretary of State does, that this is directly linked to the Iranian government. John? Yes, but I think you, you need to qualify that by saying the Iranian government isn't, um, isn't a government like any other. If you take a look at the U.S. government, if the president wants to kill Osama bin Laden, he gives an order to the CIA director and the secretary of defense, and that goes through the channels of government. The Iranian government is split between the government that is in a secular form, which is the president and the prime minister and, and, um, and their legislature, but the real government behind the scenes is the ayatollahs and the religious arm of the government, which actually controls everything that matters. And that means the military services, the clandestine services, the intelligence services. So this could actually be launched by one part of the Iranian government without a lot of consultation with the other part. Uh, Roy, what do you make of this? Tell me, you, you wrote a book that was about this four Iranians who were uh, killed at a Berlin restaurant in 1992. So you have contacts, mm -hmm. extensive contacts. Um, based on what I know um, from the pattern of Iran's behavior since 1980, um, none of this un is unusual, and there is great precedence for everything that we find in this story. First of all, this is not the first time Iran has had has tried to uh, uh, conduct an operation here in Washington D.C. In 1980, Iran conducted um, a successful assassination operation against a former deputy of the Shah uh, in the suburbs of Maryland. Um, and uh, there's also precedence for Iran wishing to assassinate a former Saudi ambassador. In fact, in 1990, there was an assassination attempt by uh, a man named Abdul Rahman Bani Hashimi in Sweden. The Swedish authorities detained him, then deported him to Iran, only for him to return to Europe about two years later and show up at the restaurant at the assassination that I've written about in 1992. Um, so all the pieces kind of fit together with the previous 32-year pattern of Iran's behavior internationally and the way the regime has dealt with uh, its perceived enemies. Iran is under tremendous pressure, and they're looking at two kinds of pressure. One major piece of that is a time bomb. Um, they control the bomb part of it in that they're developing, allegedly, uh, nuclear weapons. Israel probably controls the time part of it, which is Iran assumes that when they get to a certain stage of development, Israel is going to strike its nuclear facilities there. That's one level of tension. Put that aside. There's a whole other level of tension with the Arab Spring. So you've got this largely Sunni awakening unfolding in countries like Bahrain, in Egypt, in other places that is spreading. And Iran, which is a Shia-controlled uh, country, um, and don't forget the, the things going on right now in Syria, which is a majority Sunni population, who are the enablers and the supporters behind the scenes of all that, sometimes not behind the scenes, and that's the Saudis. 
And those two pressures are at the forefront of everybody in both policymaking in Iran, mm -hmm. but also in their intelligence and military services, um, feeling that pressure and trying to figure out how to strike out. This would have sent two messages, one to Saudi Arabia as a dire warning, and two, because of the location, Washington, D.C., one to the United States. And I think it would have been a bold gamut on their part, but they've done that before, behind the El Khobar bombings in Saudi Arabia, the U.S. Uh, Air Force Base, right. behind the Marine Barracks bombings in Lebanon, behind the Hariri assassination in Lebanon. This, as, as, as our author has pointed out, this is not unknown territory for them. But what would they expect the reaction would be from the United States or from, I mean, you're saying that there might not be a reaction if the United States, uh, if this attack had been successful? I think that's the curveball, Charlie, because the first question you ask is not would they do it or why would they do it. The first question is, why would they use a Mexican drug cartel? Yeah. And that is the thing that would give the first clues as to the source of the attack that would give it some modicum of cover and maybe confusion. But I don't think that would have lasted too long, not with the FBI and the CIA and the NSA and everybody picking back through how this happened. What was it that led them to uncover this, John? I mean, you know the FBI, you work there, you know the director of national intelligence, you were the assistant director earlier. Well, it... It actually came in um, not the way we would have intended to uncover it, which is, you know, through, um, through counterintelligence measures against Iran. It came in through a Drug Enforcement Administration confidential source working with the drug gangs in Mexico as his target. And as this Iranian individual approached him, he didn't believe that it was connected to the Iranian government, neither did his DEA handlers or later the FBI. But as they peeled back the layers of the communications pieces and who was connected to whom, it increasingly looked like everybody beyond this guy who was talking to the drug informant had Iranian government connections. It's an odd path for a case okay, like this. Okay, let me go back to Roya. Attorney General Eric Holder, who announced the murder plot at a news conference in Washington, said it was, quote, directed and approved by elements of the Iranian government and specifically senior members of the Quds force. Who are they? Uh, it's an elite group within the um, Revolutionary Guard Corps inside Iran that I think actually today is the most powerful faction holding power in Iran beyond even the Supreme Leader, beyond the current sitting lame duck president of Iran and so on and so forth. I think the guards are uh, the people who are running the show and the goods force has been uh, overseeing operations such as this again since 1980. What I find really interesting is that even though uh, this plot wouldn't fly in Hollywood, it is over and over the kind of thing that Iran has done. Um, for instance, 10, 15 years ago when Iranian satellite broadcasts from Los Angeles starting to beam inside Iran, uh, Iran used Cubans to intercept those broadcasts that used to really uh, upset the regime um, when they aired and as they be were becoming more and more popular. Um, in Europe, whenever they needed henchmen to go after various Iranian targets, they used Algerians, Lebanese, and they set up businesses that uh, appeared like semi-legitimate businesses, as the character in this story in Corpus Christi had been involved with. Right. Um, the one who's, the one who's under employ, arrest. Yes. Uh, and, and would employ them in these sort of front businesses and then later on send them mm. on other various um, uh, projects and assassination One plots. last question for you. What do you think the Saudis might do now, now that they know this was in action? <laughs> I think you and I here sitting in Washington and in the United States might be surprised by this, but I don't think the Saudis are surprised by this one bit. Uh, there has been precedence to all of this, and the rivalries between Iran and Saudi Arabia have only uh, become uh, more and more pronounced since the uh, Arab Spring and uh, since the growing of the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And, John, what might the United States do? Well, I think uh, the United States is looking at those other two things, which is uh, the effect of the Arab Spring, but also the Iranian nuclear problem um, and understanding those pressures. So I don't think you'll see a direct response to this other than a diplomatic uh, response, perhaps. 
Um, I think I think that the United States is looking at Iran as um, a much larger problem. But you have to say, for the U.S. government, this is a bit of a wake-up call as to what they are willing to do. That would even surprise people who spend all their time subscribing to the worst uh, possibilities. Thank you very much.